Hi, everybody, and welcome back to part three of my commentary on Triumph of the Will. Hopefully, you've already checked out part one and part two. In part three, we're actually going to start getting into some of the meat of Triumph of the Will with the opening of the Nazi Party Congress of 1934. As always, if you enjoy this video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button for a like. Make sure you share with at least one other friend. Also, subscribe to the channel so that you can stay up to date with the development of both this project and all of the other projects that we have going on here at Sheepcorn. Without any more hesitation, let's check it out. All right, after a relatively quick parade to get us to the venue and open the Nazi Party Congress, we're finally going to start with the series of speeches from leading members of the party giving updates as to how things are going in Nazi Germany by September of 1934. <laughs> First up on the roster, we're going to have Deputy Reichsfuhrer Rudolf Hess, and we should really think about him as basically the vice president of Nazi Germany. He is second in command to Adolf Hitler, and he is seen as the successor to Hitler. Interestingly enough, Rudolf Hess stuck around a long time after the war because right before the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Rudolf Hess actually parachuted into Scotland requesting an audience with Winston Churchill in an attempt to forge an Anglo-German alliance in opposition to communism from the Soviet Union. Because he was not in Germany for the events of the Holocaust, he was exempted from the death penalty and for the charges of crimes against humanity and spent the rest of his life in Lansdowne Prison, ultimately dying in 1987. Den Kongress des sechsten Parteitages eröffne ich mit dem ehrfurchtsvollen Gedenken an den in die Ewigkeit eingegangenen Generalfeldmarschall und Reichspräsidenten von Hindenburg. Here we see Rudolf Hess starting off his speech commemorating and memorializing Reichsfield Marshal and president of the Weimar Republic, Paul von Hindenburg. It's significant that Hess is paying tribute to Paul von Hindenburg for a couple of reasons. Number one is he really was the most trusted man in Weimar, Germany. He had been a hero of World War I and one of the organizers of the great victory over the Russian army at Tannenberg in 1914. He, along with Erich von Ludendorff, orchestrated and helped to support the overthrow of the Kaiser at the end of the war to create the Weimar Republic. And in the 1920s, he became the president of the Republic to try to solidify popular support for the new government. Now, it's also significant that he and Hitler had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship with each other, having run head to head against each other for the position of president. However, it's also significant to note that it is Paul von Hindenburg who specifically appointed Hitler in an attempt to ward off what people perceived as the growing threat of a communist revolution in the Weimar Republic. Hindenburg was the last power left in Germany that could have stopped Adolf Hitler after becoming chancellor and then following it up by winning the Reichstag for the Nazi party. However, President Hindenburg died in office and at this point, Hitler went to the people to pass a plebiscite in order to combine the offices of Chancellor and Reich's president into one now combined office of the Führer, which in German just means the leader. Wir gedenken des Generalfeldmarschalls 
als des ersten Soldaten des großen Krieges und gedenken damit zugleich unserer gefallenen Kameraden. Ich begrüße die hohen Vertreter auswärtiger Staaten. Now, it's really tempting here to say that these are representatives of the Axis countries. However, the Axis wasn't yet in place. And in fact, we didn't even have a German-Italian alliance yet. Uh, other than the two that we can identify, the other possibilities are Bulgaria, Finland, Hungary, Iraq, Romania, Croatia, and Slovakia. Welche der Partei? Now, it's actually really hard to track this down, but I'm pretty sure that this one is Galeazzo Siano, who was not only Mussolini's son-in-law, but at the time he was the undersecretary for press and propaganda under Il Duce's government in Italy. Die Ehre erweisen, an der Tagung teilzunehmen. In aufrichtiger Kameradschaft begrüßt die Bewegung besonders die Vertreter der jetzt unter dem Befehl des Führers stehenden Wehrmacht. This point is very significant because of Hitler has combined the offices of Chancellor and President into the now combined office of Führer, giving the party, and therefore him personally, direct control over the military of Germany. Mein Führer, um Sie stehen die Fahnen und Standarten dieses Nationalsozialismus, wenn ihr Tuch einst morsch sein wird. Erst dann werden die Menschen ganz fähig sein, rückblickend die Größe unserer Zeit zu verstehen und zu begreifen, was sie, mein Führer, für Deutschland bedeuten. The point about cloth in the flags rotting what he means is, if those flags are allowed to hang in this hall and we are allowed to retain power and control for a long period of time, it's only then that people will really understand the benefits of not only National Socialism, but also of the Fuhrer Prinzip. When we entrust you with so incredibly much power, those dividends will not be paid out quickly, but eventually they will be paid out, and then we will understand the significance of what we've accomplished here in 1934. Sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. Again, classic Führer Prinzip. We are going to leave all the thinking to Hitler, and we are going to follow because that is our dutiful obligation to the nation state. Let him judge, and we will judge the same. Let him act, and we will act the same. It's pure groupthink. Unser Dank ist das Gelöbnis, in guten und in bösen Tagen zu Ihnen zu stehen. Komme, was da wolle. Dank Ihrer Führung wird Deutschland sein Ziel erreichen. Heimat zu sein. Heimat zu sein für alle Deutschen der Welt. This is also no small point because since German nationalism really started to coalesce together in the early part of the 1830s, people had debated whether it was more important to focus on what they called Kleine Deutschland, small Germany, or Grosch Deutschland, large Germany, which would have included the Austrian Empire because Austrians are ethnically German. Hitler has very clearly taken a side in this particular debate and suggested that only when all Germans live together inside of the borders of the Reich will Germany ever be a completed project. Sie waren uns der Garant des Sieges. Sie sind uns 
der Garant des Friedens. We now move into 11 other high-ranking members of the Nazi party who are responsible for different areas of policy and are going to provide updates in terms of what Hitler's government has been able to accomplish since it took power early in the previous year. The first speaker is going to be Adolf von Wagner, who is a member of the Sturmabteilung, the SA, and he's actually going to take a very important position on behalf of Hitler. At the end of June and early July of 1934, Hitler and the SS undertook an operation called the Night of Long Knives, wherein they purged not only members of the Nazi party, but also a very large chunk of the upper tier leadership within the SA, within the Sturmabteilung. One of the people who was killed in the Night of Long Knives was Ernst Ruhm. Now, Ruhm was significant because he was the leader of the SA, and he took a political position wherein he said, Nazism cannot stop now that we have taken power. Nazism has to have a permanent, ongoing, perpetual revolution. Because Ruhm was liquidated by Hitler, Hitler now has to distance himself from that idea of a permanent and continuing revolution, and that's what Adolf von Wagner is going to do. Es gibt keine Revolution als Dauererscheinung, die nicht zur vollkommenen Anarchie führen müsste. So wie die Welt nicht von Kriegen lebt, so leben die Völker nicht von Revolutionen. Es gibt nichts Großes auf dieser Erde, das Jahrtausende beherrschte und in Jahrzehnten entstanden wäre. Der größte Baum hat auch das längste Wachstum hinter sich. Was Jahrhunderten trotzt, wird auch nur in Jahrhunderten stark. Next up, we've got Alfred Rosenberg, who is a Nazi <clears throat> philosopher and the major author of most of their racial theories, as well as the Nuremberg Laws, which systematically took away the rights of Jewish people living inside of Nazi Germany. Das ist unser unerschütterlicher Glaube an uns selbst. Das ist unsere Hoffnung auf die Jugend gerade heute, die stürmisch vorwärts schreiten und berufen sein wird, das Werk fortzusetzen, das in den Sturmjahren der Revolte von 1918 in München gegründet wurde, der ganz Deutschland erfasste und heute schon in weltgeschichtlicher Bedeutung durch die ganze deutsche Nation verkörpert wird. Next up, we've got Otto Dietrich, who is the Third Reich's overseer of the press. And one of the things that's important to notice about him is how much he emphasizes the requirement for the press to report the truth. So what does it mean to report the truth? It means that you will and must be held accountable for reporting what the party has officially designated as truth. The press, therefore, becomes an organ and an extension of the party itself to control the hearts and minds of the people. Denn die Wahrheit ist das Fundament, mit dem die Macht der Presse steht und fällt. Und dass man die Wahrheit über Deutschland berichtet, das ist die einzige Forderung, die wir an die Presse auch des Auslandes stellen. Next, we've got Fritz Todd, who was the director of the head office of engineering. His primary responsibility was overseeing the construction of infrastructure and particularly the Autobahn. This is one of the infrastructure projects that really allowed Nazi Germany to become very, very efficient in its industrial production and transportation and became a central and key point in the Nazi party's accomplishments. <laughs> Mit dem Bau der Reichsautobahn ist an 51 Stellen im Reich begonnen. Obwohl die Arbeit 
noch in den Anfängen steckt, sind heute schon 52.000 Mann auf den Baustellen und weitere 100.000 Mann in den Lieferwerken, bei der Baustoffindustrie, bei den Brückenbauanstalten oder sonst durch das erst beginnende Werk. Next up, we've got a very brief appearance from Fritz Reinhard, who was the state secretary in the German finance ministry. He's going to talk about how work is being done everywhere. And again, in the context of just coming out of the Great Depression, this really shows people the prosperity that they're associating not only with the rise of Nazism, but also with Hitler's ascendancy to being the Fuhrer. Wohin wir blicken, überall wird gebaut. Überall werden Werte verbessert und Werte neu geschaffen. Überall herrscht seit einem Jahr reges Leben und wird auch in Zukunft reges Leben herrschen. Next we have Richard Walter Dare who is the Reich's Minister for Food and Agriculture, and he is going to give us some of the elements of socialism that is inherent in National Socialism, which is this close connection between the industrial production and the food production, the agricultural production, and the unity of production from both of those different elements of the economy. The Gesundheit unserer Bauern is the first Voraussetzung for the Blühen und Gedeihen unserer Industrie für den deutschen Binnenhandel und für den deutschen Export. After Dare, we hear from Julius Stryker, who was the publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper called Der Stürmer. Stryker is important to us because he represents the Nazi racial ideology. And he talks about how the purity of race is an essential bedrock for the foundation of the Reich. Ein Volk! Das nicht auf die Reinheit seiner Rasse hält, geht zugrunde. Our next speaker is Robert Ley, who was the head of the German Labor Front. The German Labor Front was a Nazi party apparatus that replaced all of the independent trade and labor unions inside of Germany. This allowed the party to directly control workers through their trade unions and exercise control over the labor force. His primary focus is on the socialism aspect of National Socialism, which is the unity and equality of all labor. Muss von einem einzigen Gedanken beherrscht werden, den deutschen Arbeiter zu einem aufrechten, stolzen und gleichberechtigten Volksgenossen zu machen. Next we have Hans Frank, and Hans Frank is a significant contribution to this because he was the chief jurist of Nazi Germany. What that means is he was basically like the chief justice of the Supreme Court. He is intended to be independent and impartial. But what he actually says here is that the decision-making powers of the judiciary are now subservient to the will of the Fuhrer because Hitler himself is responsible for bringing freedom and justice and order. Ich kann nur als Führer des deutschen Rechtsdieners sagen, dass da das Fundament des nationalsozialistischen Staates die nationalsozialistische Rechtsordnung ist, Für uns unser oberster Führer auch der oberste Gerichtsherr ist. Und dass wir, die wir wissen, wie heilig gerade unserem Führer die Grundsätze dieses Rechtslebens sind, auch ihren Volksgenossen versichern können, ihr Leben, auch ihr bürgerliches Dasein ist gesichert in diesem nationalsozialistischen Staat der Ordnung, der Freiheit und des Rechts. Our penultimate speaker is Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. In the 1930s, propaganda was seen as a new tool to create and craft a well-organized and functioning society. Propaganda at the time did not have the kind of nefarious undertones that we associate with it today, and was really seen as a way of winning the hearts and minds of the people. Dr. Goebbels is significant because he is one of the only highly educated Nazis. 
There were, of course, other educated Nazis, but Goebbels is one of the very, very few to actually have earned his PhD. Goebbels' PhD was earned in the field of philology, which is all about the study of both verbal and written language. Goebbels was one of the most personally devoted and dedicated Nazi leaders to Hitler and to the idea of National Socialism. To me, he comes off as an incredibly creepy and almost vampire-like figure who really does demonstrate this blind devotion to his ideology. Möge die helle Flamme unserer Begeisterung niemals zum Erlöschen kommen. Sie allein gibt auch der schöpferischen Kunst einer modernen politischen Propaganda Licht und Wärme. Aus den Tiefen des Volkes stieg sie empor. Und zu den Tiefen des Volkes muss sie immer wieder herniedersteigen, um dort ihre Wurzeln zu suchen und ihre Kraft zu finden. Es mag gut sein, Macht zu besitzen, die auf Gewehren ruht. Besser aber und beglückender ist es, das Herz eines Volkes zu gewinnen und es auch zu behalten. That's it for part three. In part four, we're going to start off with the very last speaker who is the leader of the Reichsarbeitdienst or the Reichs Labor Service who's going to lead us into the next scene, which is all about the German workers being unified and organized together under the party. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope that you learned something. If you did, please again leave a thumbs up for a like, subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit the bell notification for updates on when all of our new videos post. Post, leave a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next one.